last year, I attended GOSCON, and with a number of my clients, and a number of you are my clients out there, um, and we sat through a number of panels, and one of the things that came across in these panels was there was a, a large disconnect uh, between the open source community and the, uh, uh, the public sector around procurement. And specifically, I, I would sit in meetings and with my clients, or sit in these sessions with my clients, and they, and, and they would be saying, well, this is all great, but I can't, uh, how do I get this stuff in? And they would raise that question, and the, uh, the open source uh, vendor would say, oh, it's easy. You just download it and compile it on your machine. Well, <laughs> the point of that conversation, I think, was what they were concerned about were things like, in most state laws have open and competitive procurement clauses that they have to adhere to. So the question became, if I go out and, and just download one ERP system and compile it, am I violating the state law for open and competitive procurement? Uh, so I got thinking about this, and it, and it bothered me after this, because I believe that open source is really the future in, uh, particularly in public sector, where our resources are dwindling and uh, we're being asked to do more with less. Uh, certainly, open source is, a, is one way to take uh, continue the level of service we provide while we uh, have reduced budgets. But uh, beyond that, um, so I started carrying this conversation forward, and I, I talked with a number of, of my clients and friends about it, and, and uh, Debbie Bryant got involved in the conversation somehow, and she sort of told me, well, put your money where your mouth is, and let's, have a talk, let's talk about it next time we, we have Gosscon. So here I am. Uh, what we've done and what we're going to try to do is we've assembled a panel. I'm not going to, they're experts in various fields, but I'm not sure any of us are quite yet experts in, in acquiring open source in, in the public sector. Uh, but we're going to try and hold a community conversation. I didn't think having a series of lectures was appropriate. Uh, what I did think was uh, having you ask questions of, a, of, a, of an advanced panel would be probably a useful conversation to have. Hopefully this conversation will carry forward out of this room and beyond when we can kind of address some of the issues. Uh, we do have some some level of expertise, uh, well, all through the panel, to be frank, but Andy Stein, particularly, has done a good job getting uh, open source and Newport News, those of you that don't know him. And I'm going to start with Andy, and we'll let each of the panelists sort of introduce themselves and tell us the perspective they bring to, the, uh, to this, con or this conversation. Uh, I'm not going to use a microphone, so I'll yeah. stand so my voice carries. Uh, I have a lot to say and uh, very little time to say, so I made a few notes so I can get the key points across. Um, I will make a few provocative statements, uh, which I believe to be true, and hope to provoke a good conversation. Um, first, I'll start with this uh, American thing, where you get what you pay for, which I learned recently. But I would say that. <laughs> but I would change it a little bit. I would say it is more like you get what you ask for, and by ask I mean what's in your RFP. That's what you get. And the problem is with that RFP process, and I will touch on that just a little bit. Uh, if the RFP does not allow for collaborative projects, then we will continue to create more silos. And this topic will be addressed more in depth tomorrow in at least two sessions. So uh, watch out for that. A uh, couple points I want to make that I think are important here. That, but, but first a statement, I, a provocative statement, another provocative statement would be the traditional government procurement process does not work in my opinion. And it does not work for these two reasons. One is it limits open source alternatives. And I'll just define that just a little bit how it does that. But second, that it blocks future collaborative initiatives such as shared cost development, implementation, and service. So let's do the first part of the RFP. It assumes, uh, the RFP process assumes a vendor economy that is limited to established service providers with a significant marketing budget. We usually put out RFPs with short deadlines and very complex ones. So we expect the community, the vendor community, to respond quickly while the open source community does not do that. The open source community that does not have an army of marketing people surfing the net for all these RFPs out there that just keep on throwing money at it. It doesn't work that way. So that's the first problem. 
<laughs> with this process. The second is that it insists on an established user base, at least in my state. Most of the RFPs kind of go out like this. I want solutions that you can prove that at least five of these things are installed in my state. Well, that means that whatever is installed will continue to grow, and there is no opportunity for new guys coming in. Second piece is how it um, does not allow for collaboration is because the RFP and the contracts do not insist on ownership of the copyright. We allow that process to default. And it defaults usually to the copyright is owned by the vendor who creates the goods. Therefore, if I want to start a new collaborative, I can't, because I don't own the goods. So I'm going to leave it at that. I hope I provoke a few thoughts in your mind and we'll continue the conversation later. Yeah. Us? So actually, I was asked if we would use the microphones. Oh. Uh, so they when they recorded. All right, so I'm Tim Vavershack. I'm from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Information Technology Division. Uh, in the original email that was sent out to this group, we weren't necessarily directly asked to provoke everyone here, so. <laughs> I'm just gonna give you information and let you know where I'm coming from, what's going on in Massachusetts, and then I'll sit down and then we'll, we'll have some discussion based on Andy's comments earlier. Uh, I, I manage a group called the Shared Services Group in uh, ITD. Shared services are applications that are developed for more than one agency. Um, right now we have um, five big ones that I manage, uh, including a group that's called the Open Source Development Group. So the focus of that group is to develop as much open source as possible, to evangelize where possible across the government, and to get as much open source out there, and then just to um, foster collaboration between groups as much as possible. Uh, ITD as an organization provides oversight to the executive branch. So we have about 80 agencies in the executive branch. We work hand in hand with a sister oversight agency called OSD who manages contracts for the, for the Commonwealth. So there's really two main ways that we can bring open source into the Commonwealth. One of them is a contract called ITS 14. It's a blanket contract whereby our agencies use um, a, a third party reseller to bring in technologies like JBoss or a Red Hat, thinks um, specific product sets. And then we have ITS 23, which is a contract that allows us to bring in contractors and to do staff augmentation. That's where the RFIs, RFRs come from. Um, so that's basically the general overview. Uh, like I said, I'm, I'm not gonna provoke you here. Our main focus in Massachusetts right now is open standards. So no matter what we bring in, whether it be open source, proprietary, shared source, our main focus is that every application we bring in conforms to open standards and allows us flexibility as we go forward. So that's it. Tim, Massachusetts promote enough people, I think. Yes. <laughs> My name is Ken Hill. Um, <clears throat> I'm here kind of representing a vendor of open source software development applications. Um, I'm a project manager of a multiple state uh, public health surveillance system um, that has that's involved right now with five four state um, public health departments and a couple of medical schools across the country um, I can bring to this panel information on how we fund this open collaborative development project how we maintain it um, and how we support it um, Kind of the history is that it started using actually proprietary software tools. Then about five years ago, we scaled it over to using open source software tools. So that's what I can bring. Thanks, Ken. Hi, I'm Jacob Carroll. I'm from the Oregon Department of Justice. I work in the Intellectual Property and Information Technology Group. And most of the solicitation procurement documents and contracts to the awardees come through our office. We review and approve them and uh, give day-to-day -day advice on intellectual property issues. So only above a certain threshold, they usually come over to our office. But, so major transactions come through us for review and approval. Good morning. <clears throat> I'm Dugan Petty. I'm the 
interim administrator with the Enterprise Information Strategy and Policy Division of the Department of Administrative Services, and also the interim CIO for the state of Oregon. However, that's not why I'm here. Why I'm here is because about 15 minutes ago, Deborah Bryant snagged me out in the hallway and said, I want you to be in this panel. And the reason, and the reason she did that was because a few years ago, when we started talking about open source uh, in, in the state of Oregon legislature, Deborah and I sat on a working group uh, to try and come up with a piece of legislation that would cause us to consider open source. Uh, and I was there because I represented procurement and had responsibility for procurement in the state of Oregon, so that's why I'm here. Uh, when Deborah snagged me, I said, Deborah, I'm trying to leave that past behind. I really don't want to bring it up now. But she said, no, no, I want you on the panel because I think she knows that that will be provocative enough to know that you had somebody who was involved and then their hands on the public procurement process. So. With that, I'm your last panelist, and I'll turn it over to Ken. And Julian, we thank you for, uh, <laughs> for stepping in at the last minute. So I would like to open this up to the floor uh, to begin with, if there are any questions you would like to ask of the panel. Oh, I already got, a, already got a hand raised. So have we gone to the top of the state attorney or someone got opinions on state law regarding this issue? Have we gone where? To the state attorney or whomever is the right? Well, I'm going to uh, So the question is, have, have we gone to the state attorney um, to, or whoever is the appropriate resource to find what we need to do to procure open source software. I'm not sure who can respond. Andy, do you want to start? Well, I, I will start it off. Um, the, the two issues here with the open source procurement, um, w w one is the acquisition of services and goods. The other is turning the um, uh, intellectual property back to the community. On the second part, I didn't involve my legal. On the first part, I don't think it's a legal issue. The first part is more, more a practice issue. Uh, one of, um, uh, you know, can we plan ahead? Can we understand a little better how the open source community works? And if you want to include them and involve them, change your practice. It's not a legal issue of uh, restructuring the RFP. Um, I have included the, the legal department in helping me word phrase in the RFP and the contract that gives us uh, copyright privilege at the end of the contract. So in that respect, I, I, did, I did go through that process, a very tedious process. Um, and it's also, <laughs> it's also very tedious to actually end up successfully negotiating with a vendor that accepts those terms, and then what do you do when they don't? It's, it's, it's a mess. So it's, it's very, very complicated. If you have any other thoughts. So I guess I am the fortunate person of being the only attorney uh, on this panel. So uh, don't hold that against me. Could you rephrase the question? Could you repeat the question again? I, I don't know if I understood it correctly. So I think one is a procurement issue, which Dugan might have a pretty good perspective on. Uh, another is a legal issue. If we want to address them one by one, we can. Okay. Let me see if I can start with the procurement side of that question. I, I think it's a good one, and I think the answer is no. Nobody has gone directly to the Attorney General and said, it, it, can, we, can we buy open source? Uh, because I think the answer is, yeah, we can buy it. The problem isn't uh, that the law prevents us from buying it. It's how we go about sourcing it and what it is we're sourcing. Uh, I mentioned a few years ago, Deborah and I got together and talked about a, a law around this, and, we, and there were some questions about, well, how do we do this? Well, we have software contracts with software licensing companies, but you know, to some extent there are contracts in there that are open source. We have a managed service provider contract right now that has application development that can work with open source. So there are ways to come into it. In terms of licensing, if there's something to buy, the procurement process would allow you to buy it. The problem is this, and, and Andy touched on it. The conventional RFP, the way it's written, is written around buying commercial software. It's structured to have some type of a competitive process aimed at buying that. 
The way you structure an RFP for buying commercial software is different than how you would uh, structure an RFP for buying automobiles, or how you'd have an, off an RFP or an invitation to bid for office supplies. The problem, I think, is this, is that we haven't crafted a market-centric way to buy what you're talking about buying here. So it takes a little different way to go about doing it. Then the question is, if you craft something that makes sense in terms of making a decision about the acquisition or sourcing what you need, and it seems to be a reasonable way to do it, does the procurement statutes allow us to do that? And there's a perception around procurement that, well, we have to go out and put everything out to an invitation to bid. That's one method of sourcing, but it's not the only method. Oregon law now allows you allows the procurement officer to, to use an invitation to bid, allows you to use a competitive sealed proposal process. It also allows you to use a special procurement, which really allows you to design a process specific to the market that you're trying to buy in, so that it's not subject to the bid rules or the RFP rules. So there is an avenue to do it. It takes a couple of things to be able to use that procurement avenue. It takes somebody Andy touched on this as well. It takes somebody who can understand the planning aspect of it so you lay out a rational decision-making process in a plan for what you're trying to acquire. And then it takes somebody out of your procurement shop that can navigate those procurement rules and take advantage of the flexibility in statute to establish a special procurement that's structured around the way you need to buy what it is you're buying. So let's just take a hypothetical. <clears throat> let's assume, and Andy made this, this comment, I've heard it elsewhere today, <clears throat> if you want to use a collaborative approach and maybe you want to build something where you actually would pay for something like almost like a design competition, there's a way to structure that. There is a way to build a, a process where you would have steps, where you would have uh, some kind of collaborative effort. Maybe at some point you say that you're going to fund so much of that effort and you do it in a competitive way. You have to meet the threshold in ORS 279, which says that it's not, it doesn't adversely impact competition, that is that a variety of competitors can compete, and it's likely to be economical, I'm paraphrasing here, save, save money for, for the agency. I think those are the two criteria for a special procurement. So if your procurement people are knowledgeable of that, you can make that determination, then you can craft that process aimed at, at, at buying something that makes makes sense in this open source marketplace. And that's really the missing piece. Planning and then somebody who can engineer or navigate that procurement system. And, and that's, frankly, the change in law is, I think, two or three years old now. It's relatively new. A lot of procurement organizations haven't come to understand how they can involve themselves in that flexibility. Uh, just one more item on this. Th this issue of special procurements began about 10 years ago. And uh, it, it started in Alaska with a change in their statute. Montana made a change, and then we made that change in Oregon. The American Bar Association Model Procurement Code, which was adopted, I think, in 1999, put a new source selection method for special procurement. And it was built around technology because it was a recognition that the old processes of bids and RFPs weren't working to buy technology any kind of technology, they just weren't working well and it recognized that technology was changing at such a rapid pace that it took special procurements that needed to be redesigned and away from those standard bid process and RFP rules. So I think there's an avenue there. It's just having the people that can navigate that, yes. So with that special process, have you seen, have any uh, Oregon agencies used that? And if not, since it was modeled after what was going on in other states, where's the best place to look uh, outside of Oregon for, for examples? Well, yes. There, um, I know that we use when we, uh, about a year and a half ago, maybe two years ago, the state of Oregon was engaged in a strategic sourcing initiative uh, for about 12 to 18 months. And uh, the procurement processes that were used uh, in the categories that were strategically sourced were under special procurement exemptions. And they involved multiple rounds of bidding, and they were designed uh, to, to have an effective decision-making outcome for the markets that we were sourcing in. But those we were sourcing in markets that, that, don't that, that doesn't necessarily transfer. You can't take that model and, and put it in open source. I think you have to sit down and say, 
what's a reasonable decision process that we should go through that reaches a, an effective public decision for how we acquire open source and then design the process and then come in and justify the exemption. No, I think Dugan covered the procurement side. On the legal side, I think the presentation that we had just um, a little while ago from Mr. Goldman at Navica, I believe, he put forth a really good plan on organizational best practices and how to address the integration of open source software into an institution. And I think from a legal perspective, that type of process that's put in place really helps the legal department, uh, puts them at ease to some extent, and that they're involved with the process so that these best practices and compliance are put together. Because that's one of the major problems that we face is that we all know that open source is going to come into a state agency. It's how the state agency is actually going to manage and, and do compliance for that open source software. I want to actually, I'll give you in just a second. I want to ask Ken to respond from a different perspective. And that is, this is all great. We can develop RFPs and send them out there. Will vendors respond? Um, <clears throat> it really depends. Um, from a, as an open source developer, uh, it's hard to respond to an RFP that has very specific requirements of platform. I mean, we see some that say, you know, we want to develop an application, but it must work on like a Microsoft platform. Um, uh, so, and we're not a Microsoft shop, so it's hard to even we just kind of right. set those aside. Um, and he brought up the um, time frame. A lot of the RFPs have very tight time frames, and we, us developers, don't have the marketing staff that just all they do eight hours a day is look at our RFPs and write them. Um, and so um, I think that's something that open source developers need to, to start addressing themselves. But I think what I look at it is it just increase the costs of, of doing business. And I, I just want to add to that just very briefly. Uh, one way that, because we did recognize that as well, is a lot of the RFPs that go out from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, they're, they're very specific. And a lot of times the requirements get driven because of a specific product set that one agency saw. And that does exactly what I need. So all of a sudden, that's what I want. And that RFP speaks to one specific implementation. And as, as an oversight agency, when an agency needs um, new applications, when they want to use what, what our IT bond that gets floated every so often, every two or three years, uh, they need to come to ITD with a proposal. And what we're, we've been trying to do is really get to the heart of the matter from those proposals and say, okay, what do you, what's your real business case? What's your real business need? So we can write a more open RFP so that more people can come and bid on it. And it isn't a specific, you know, it must be on Windows, it must use SQL Server, that it, it, it's open to a whole bunch of different options. Um, in, in Oregon, uh, all public jurisdictions, counties, cities, uh, special districts, school districts, uh, and uh, state agencies, with the exception of the Oregon University system, uh, are, are covered by ORS 279. And so it's a common set of statutes so that a special procurement and those methods of sourcing that are set out in ORS 279 are the same. Um, so it's the same statutory foundation. However, a county um, may establish a different set of rules that they operate under so they can adjust it uh, to some degree. But we all have that same common uh, foundation for statute. Yeah, 
Yeah, um, if my memory serves me right, and, and I'm trying to put this in my past, so I've had some success at that, as I noticed, but um, when we revised the statute, uh, the formal limit for an RFP or an ITB, I believe, was $150,000. And then there was a, a, a smaller, an intermediate procurement sourcing process that I think was between $75,000 and $150,000 that ha I think required three quotes. So there, are, there is that gradation. However, some jurisdictions uh, have, have chosen to be more restrictive in how they've adopted that within their rules and regulations. And they may have some overlays around uh, emerging and, uh, small businesses and uh, minority business contractors and so forth. And obviously, outside of Oregon's may change. Um, one other, I just thought of this, is that with the gradations of the the dollar amount to the contracts, either requiring you to go out to bid or not. Um, another issue as developers is um, many times some agencies will release an RFP just basically as a sole source. They've already pre-identified somebody. Um, and they so there's no opportunity to be able to present um, an, an option as a developer on some of these uh, RFPs. Yeah. yeah. Uh, just a couple things. Um, what we're wrestling with this problem about what to send to procurement and what not to send to procurement. If you look at the open source model, it really speaks to, on the, on the one end, as a, a GPL-based open source license, it's, and there's no cost involved, and there's, there's no license risk involved, then does it actually hit the procurement radar? Because typically, if there's no cost involved, you know, procurement in my book is really about something I want to buy. <laughs> if I'm not buying anything, then why would I be having a conversation with procurement? If I'm downloading it because the GPL license allows me to do that without any cost, then I don't see that there's a lead time involved with procurement laws. Um, and so I tested this theory with my own shop uh, at ODA. I asked my managers, but how much open source software do we have in our environment? And I got all kinds of mixed responses with that. And so I commissioned a uh, network scan. I said, okay, since so nobody seems to know, uh, let's scan all the PCs, let's scan the servers, and let's figure it out. And I isolated about five, just about 5,000 instances of open source software within my environment. Now some of that was the same software, development tools, monitoring tools, some applications uh, based, on a, based on a Microsoft SMS scan. Um, but then I asked, well, how, did that, how can this be? Did we go through our standards for this? Did we go through procurement for this? Um, have we ever had any problems with the software causing failed conditions? And the answer was no. And so this is, this is one reason why I'm in this breakout session. When do we actually need to go through procurement with open source software that doesn't cost us anything, and the licensing is an openly usable license. Now, discuss it. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take a whack at this, you know, uh, and then, but I, my, our attorney here is uh, handy. Um, I think if it's free uh, and there's no cost, the procurement law applies to every expenditure of public funds. If there's no expenditure of public funds, uh, then I think there's not a problem with procurement per se. The procurement office may have a set of mandatory software contracts that they want you to buy off of. So there's a question about that. And if there is, there may be some breach in faith between you and the procurement office, uh, I don't know. That's one consideration. But I think the big issue here is whether it's really the camel's nose under the tent. Because if there are follow-on expenditures of funds that are really driven by that free software, then there's probably a question about whether that trips the threshold and whether the, that expenditure of public funds can be competitively made, which is what the statute intended. Uh, so I think the question is what happens with that. Cause, and, and that may be unique, really, to open source. So, and that may take a more contemplated 
planning process or procurement process about where you ultimately want to go and how you compete that. And, and, and that gets to a little bit of Ken's point here as well, is that if somebody's got an RFP out there that is really wired for only one solution, that should be challenged. Because if it truly is a sole source, there's a mechanism and statute and a justification to do that and don't waste people's time. Justify it and buy it if it truly is a sole source. If it isn't, then you ought to do a competitive RFP. And if, it's, if that isn't justified and people are doing an RFP to get to only one vendor when it's truly not a sole source, then that should be challenged. Yeah, I would agree with Dugan. Um, agencies are a creature. They're just a creature of statute. They're not like a corporation. Uh, they can only follow the statutes that, that, they, that embody them. And so one thing, you know, so you have to, you know, a state agency versus a corporation. Corporations have the flexibility to do a lot of things. Agencies, you know, are bound by the statutes that they have, so they have to follow them. And in the situation that you presented, I would probably argue that there are probably costs associated with open source software that are not direct costs, but are indirect costs. For example, some of the things Dugan brought up, but also some of the liabilities that go with the licenses. Some of the liabilities that go with integrating that software. So, I mean, I guess my, you know, my answer would be, they probably do have to be, in some circumstances, competitively procured, and in others, they have to follow a different route one of the other avenues. The procurement rules are pretty flexible so that you can take advantage of a lot of different ones. And if it's below a certain threshold, in a lot of cases, it doesn't really matter. But determining how those costs come in is very gray. I see what your point is. It's like, well, okay, it didn't cost me anything to download it. The license has you know, you know, certain restrictions, certain liabilities, but not a lot. How do I know when I've reached that threshold? It's a very difficult decision. And you know, I guess you sort of have to take a full compass view of, you know, the overhead cost for that software. So, and there are, I, I remember there was a question before talking about brand name justifications. I believe when people were talking about whether you know, an RFP had Microsoft you know, as, a, as a brand justified, the procurement rules also deal with that as well. So if someone does actually specify a brand name, there is some reasonable opportunity for someone to specify an alternative. And the procurement office can take it, you know, approve uh, what they would consider a substitute for that. So there is a mechanism available for that that vendors can use. Yeah, I'm going to pop on my feet. I, I speak better when I stand. Um, I would like to broaden this question that Ben asked to to the spectrum of acquiring products, open source products versus employing some sort of open source processes, maybe products included, into creating something bigger. Applications, vertical applications. So consider now the other extreme, not of you know, downloading uh, tools and products that is you know, free and maybe uh, argument could be made there's not much to worry about. Just download it and use it. Uh, the other extreme is ERP. Do we want to do an ERP? And, um, well, what options do we have? Uh, off the shelf vendors, or maybe do some open source Compere, but nobody would believe, I don't think, in this room that you could download Compere and expect to run your agency's ERP. It's not going to work, right? You're going to download it, and then you're going to put in money to make it work. So, in the end, it's going to have to be then uh, uh, funds will have to be expended to do this. One is uh, potentially a collaborative approach complex collaborative approach. The other one is simple silo approach of I buy it from the vendor, I pay the vendor X amount of money, and the vendor implements it with me or for me. And that's where I think the complications come in. That's where the real leverage is with open source, is when you do the bigger things. Uh, and that is where we need to focus our procurement efforts on and how do we enable these bigger opportunities, these collaborative larger opportunities. And I'll give you another example of, uh, 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 um, of a project like this. Well, there are a couple. There's a Sakai project that some of you already know in the universities. And uh, uh, that is an open source project, but still, universities downloaded, there's a cost involved. Uh, another example I could bring from, from the East Coast, uh, we were looking at taxation software for localities. And um, 
Again, we put out an RFP, then we get, get this silo vendor approaches, or there's a collaborative on taxation in North Carolina. Well, that collaborative is not going to respond to my RFP. So if I want to include them as one of the choices, I'm going to have to do extra work. If I just let the normal procurement process take its course, I'm going to limit my abilities to do collaborative engagements. So there was more questions. Yeah. Um all this open source stuff that gets downloaded, and uh, Mr. Barry has 5,000, I've got quite a bit. Is, is this, and presumably one would track, you know, keep track of this stuff, the fact that you're using it in your machine. Uh, is when does open source become an asset, and would you be legally required to track that asset? And if I track it, what value should I assign to it? <laughs> Very briefly, I would like to, uh, to approach this, and then uh, you folks, please chime in. But I'd say that, indeed, the way, the way it sounds, you know, just go ahead, keep on downloading thousands and thousands. It's, it's, it seems like it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare. I'm out of control, right? I, I don't know how much effort I'm putting into this incompatible slew of stuff that I just acquired for, quote, unquote, free. So this grassroots movement in organizations, I believe, without management oversight, without an architecture, without policies in place, without thinking this through, could become a liability rather than an asset. There's no question. Uh, I'm glad we have Andy on our panel. <laughs> you know, determining when it becomes an asset is, you know, that's that's a very complex question. I don't, I don't know the answer to that. That's more of a tax attorney type role to determine when it's an asset when you have to claim it as an asset. But um, it's just it's at that time of year where I'm going, I'm being asked, you know, uh, we need to have a software asset inventory. So. Uh, it depends how much development you do off of it, too. I would, I, I would imagine that if you have developers that are creating derivatives or creating modules based off of the open source software, I would create, that would be an asset. Now, if you're open sourcing it, all those modules, then at what point does, is it not an asset? Because if you own the rights, then it's an asset, obviously. It, and a lot of the licenses allow you to retain the copyrights. So it becomes an asset at that point. The original uh, software that you downloaded really isn't your asset. It's a collaboration of other assets that people have put together. So maybe focusing on, I mean, you know, the things, the items that you've actually created within your house, maybe a first step at least. I don't know what you're gonna do. <laughs> 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 at least that's where I would start. some financial benefit to the state or the agency, yet they discriminate because of the difficult RFP process, they discriminate against a potentially more cost-effective solution because the open source vendors cannot afford to um, respond to them. So can anybody comment on that? I think in Dugan, feel free to correct me, a lot of the RFP process is client driven from what I understand. The model is based off the agency's needs. So the education needs come from the bottom up. It needs to come from the developers up to management, up to the people who are writing the RFP for, for the agency. So that's where it really begins. So I wouldn't see really the procurement rules as an obstacle, but really the way that the agency has to address those. So the RFP has to be written in a process so that everyone can participate. I don't think there's any intention in the procurement rules to disqualify anyone from them. The idea is it's supposed to be vendor and technology neutral. And whoever has the best overall solution, you know, at a, an effective price, I mean, RFPs are value driven. So it's not just price, but these other things that come into play. And so uh, in that respect, the education has to come from that way. So. And I think if that process, the education comes from the ground up, 
then you'll see RFPs that are written in a different fashion, and you'll see people taking advantage of other special procurement rules that allow them to uh, take advantage of those vendors, hopefully. At least that's my hope. You know, uh, if I could just follow up, I, I do think that uh, even though uh, RFPs that are intended to be ag agnostic, um, they, they also, at the heart of them, are discriminatory, because that's really what they're about, to help you discriminate between different proposers to reach one that's really optimal for your need. A well-crafted RFP can be an effective tool to help you optimize your process and, and get what you need. A poorly written RFP uh, can take you in a completely different direction. And, it, and a poorly written RFP just isn't about difficulty in the open source arena. It's any place you apply it, you can have that problem with it. So. I, th I think it's really engaging the end user in, 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 in a collaborative way with the people who run the procurement process and crafting one that best considers the decision criteria that's likely to optimize the solution for your need. And if that's done well, you'll, you'll have a decent outcome. If, it, if you simply can't get there from the RFP, then it's time to use a special procurement and justify starting with a with really an open whiteboard and designing the process you need that's calculated to get the outcome you're looking for. The procurement law is written with some policy statements that talk about c competition is being healthy and beneficial, but they also talk about achieving outcomes necessary for the effective operation of government. And a procurement process that only deals with the competition but doesn't get an outcome is not a good process, and that's not what our public procurement laws intend. I intend them to be outcome oriented as well. So but on the other hand, we are hearing from a vendor who says the open source people can't afford to respond to a lot of government RFPs because that is an expensive process yeah. that they're in. Yeah, I think that's a valid criticism. You, you can find that criticism by vendors in other areas completely outside of, of open source and outside of technology. Um, it could be that the RFP can't get get you to where you need to go, and you need to design something that's intended to build in it the kind of decision-making gates that you need to achieve an outcome. And, and, I, and I think part of it is, is getting the right team together with the right shared mental model and conceptual approach to how they're going to do that, and then using, if you can't make that fit into the source selection requirements of statute under an RFP, then doing the exemption for a special procurement process. I think what also helps is in an RFP is to have, and we've, I've seen them, where there is a um, small business set aside. Uh, they'll, they'll say that, you know, we want to have at least X percent of the respondents to be a small business as defined by such and such. Um, as open source developers, that I think helps because we tend to be smaller groups of individuals. Um, or multiple companies of individuals that will want to work on a project, a collaborative software project. Um, so the RFPs need to have, you know, it's helpful to have them not just be one vendor dependent, like you're just going to, you know, buy the solution from one vendor. A lot of times in open source development, it's a, it's a team of vendors that are working together. The gentleman in the gray suit back here can raise his hand for yeah. the yeah. A couple of comments. First, I think it's important to remember that one of the reasons you use an RFP selection is because you want to put in factors other than cost. Uh, you, the invitation to bid basically you expect things tight, very tightly when you're looking for a price. RFPs are about crafting what's important to you. What, what weights are you putting on your thing? And so some of the issues of flexibility, uh, expandability, some of the things that are unique to the open source environment can in fact be put in as evaluation factors that are important that may help balance some of that, tip some of that scale without getting all the way to the special procurement process. The other part of it, though, that's coming from the other side of it, is important for people like me who have a responsibility of oversight and sort of important things. We all know we're trying to drive ourselves more to standard. So 
defining standards very well that you're after is important. But sometimes that does or can necessarily provide some limitations in the environment you're going to use. Because the cost of going off into a totally new technology and training enough people and keeping it up are beyond the pale on some of the things. So this totally technology agnostic uh, thing isn't going to fly in real enterprises and people need to get past that. On the other hand, the notion of driving for open standards and standards and where you're really allowing and supporting a lot of the open source, where a lot of open source is actually very strong. In fact, again, it gives a real benefit to open source in the RFP process. Uh, par paraphrasing on uh, Ben's question earlier, is there anything in state procurement, procurement law that would prevent an agency from evaluating, for instance, I've got a problem with my agency I'm trying to solve, evaluating all the open source alternatives to solve that problem on our own as an agency, and then deciding either to select one of those or if we decide that those uh, alternatives do not meet our needs, then go forward with an RFP for the commercial uh, products that are out there. Does anything prevent us from doing that? I think, I think what you're really talking about is a standard setting process and <clears throat> in 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 what you have to be concerned about if, if that's where you're headed to is when you go out for your RFP, you're, you're basically making a choice. You're going through some rigor and you're saying this is the universe that I want to be able to evaluate against my RFP or however my process operates. You will have some vulnerability for that RFP if somebody isn't able to play on the RFP because you've, in effect, eliminated them through that standard setting or I'll call it a pre-qualified products listing process. So the, the way to avoid that is to have at least some rigor and some public process, if you're a public sector agency, around your standard setting or your pre-qualified product process that you, you can give people a chance to come back, they can uh, review that, uh, they have some recourse, and then you establish your standard. Because then I think you have a chance to take that universe now that you've got it as a standard and go forward and compete it through an RFP or some other kind of competitive process. So uh, you can do it. Uh, where you run some risk is getting challenged in your RFP that, that vendor A doesn't get to play because you didn't you, you, you eliminated them through that standard setting process. So I think the way to avoid that is to have some kind of public notice around that and allow people to come back in and debrief around that or have a chance to challenge that and then and then call that final and good basically once you've done that process and then put that into the procurement arena. So that's I mean, that's one, that's one way to do it um, that makes your RFP or whatever your procurement process is more, more bulletproof. If, if you don't do that, it may not be a problem. If nobody raises the issue, it might not be a problem. But if they do, you may wind up having to go back to square one. That's my, that's my take on that. Um, no, I would agree. When you're talking about setting a standard, that, that's probably right. Now, if I understand, maybe I took the question a little different. Did you mean that basically you were going to adopt open source software up until the point where you thought at some point you should do a competitive solicitation? I guess what I'm looking at is what's a possible way to, to get around that issue of open source products aren't going to respond to the RFP. So what if the agency comes in and does its own evaluation prior to going to an RFP are there open source products that, that meet our need? And let's say we find one. Let's say we find one that's a good fit, and of course it's gonna have costs, but, uh, but we don't see a need to go to an RFP. So we take an open source product, we download the free stuff, we take our developers to do whatever modifications have to be made, um, and that's, you know, we've got the budget to do that, let's say, and we've got the authority to do that. It, are we running afoul of the procurement laws by doing that? My guess would be is that you would be doing a sole source procurement and you would have to 
you would have to justify, you know, using that vendor. So it is a procurement to uh, to download a free software and decide to modify it with our own resources. If we have to spend money. If well, I mean, he makes a good point. If there's no money actually being spent on it, just downloading it, the procurement side is one thing. Right. The legal side is a different thing. Is it, is it your agency expending money into labor and add hours? Well, sure we are. That oh yeah. I don't know. I don't know if that would be a procurement. I don't think so. But we have discretionary budget. I mean, we have you know not everything we do is a procurement. You know, we have staff. Right, and we have some discretion to use that staff as we see fit to, so, to meet our mission, you know, of our agents. So, uh, you could, let me. That sounds very dangerous. Yep. You also protect the public dollars. So, to the extent that as a public agency, you build a bureaucracy to build software and deploy an army of engineers to build software, independent of any analysis of what you know, the costs are up front. Regardless of whether or not there's another solution, it just sounds a little dangerous. And I think we've seen that actually in some cases where federal agencies are building software and deploying people and doing it at a cost that is much higher than what the open source community, if it was engaged roughly in the process, could do to it. Do we want to pre yeah. okay. John, I'm going to pass it on. Okay, I'm here. Yeah. Uh, I'm not a panelist, but I did stay at a Holiday Inn last night. <laughs> I'm uh, from Red Hat, and I have visibility for the whole country, and, and just, you know, a couple of thoughts come to mind. I mean, um, first thought would be we probably do 99% of our business outside of an RFP, uh, just because it, it is downloadable. Our products get started. There is no procurement cost. Um, to his point, I mean, I think the CIOs need to have the vision to say, yes, if we do this, we're going to have to staff up for it or we're going to be in trouble. And there will be costs, even if it's not a procurement cost, because it's a human that got involved that had to maintain it. That's, you know, not not playing your strategy all the way through. Um, I've kind of been tracking all these these comments along the way. It's kind of interesting because a lot of the applications, not just the Red Hat and the JBoss utilities and tools, but the applications now that are coming in like Sakai in the higher ed space, they're open source projects. And we're seeing customers in the university space go two ways. Those that want to kind of take the code and download it and maintain it themselves going in eyes wide open, knowing they're going to do that. But now there's a new crop of companies popping up, like R Smart, that come along and say, well, we'll be the red hat of the application that you're going to download. And we'll basically be like a real vendor for you and give you support and give you the updates and things like that. So the market's evolving. It's not all there yet to where you know, anyone from a Sakai could respond to an RFP. But I think over time, you're going to see the, the, the red hat model get followed through on just about every layer of the software stack. This isn't actually a question, it's more of a comment I'll throw out there. It's just listening to all of this, it occurs to me that they already be a precedent for acquiring software outside of the traditional procurement process in your organization. If you have a mainframe, if you've ever had a mainframe in your IT shop, chances are our member of an organization called Share, which has been around since the 70s, which is an open source collaborative development organization still meeting, still very active twice a year. And I know, speaking from our own history in our organization, we have already, for decades, downloaded software, modified it, and been incorporated into production uh, job streams from the share organization. And so we've already been doing the things that we're talking about here, doing this outside of the RFP process, outside of the traditional procurement process. And if that's something that exists in your organization, you might be able to leverage that as a precedent. Um, I, I want to give these guys just one last chance to kind of go through it, and we're, we're about five minutes from closing. Um, first of all, this is kind of what I thought would happen when you get to start a conversation. And my question to each of the panelists individually, and we have a minute or two to answer it, is, uh, if, we, if this is the start of the conversation, where do we need to go next? 
Don't be shy, Andy. <laughs> <laughs> I will come back to where I think the key is. I think the leverage in open source is in the process, not the product. I think the products are great, but really the process is what could save us money. And that's where the difficulty is. And that's where we need to start thinking more on, as this gentleman um, I just uh, mentioned before, how, with a share process of IBM. We've been doing this kind of collaborative processes all along. But we've been doing them at a smaller scale. Because now we're looking at, let's do this at large scale. You know, let's do an ERP this way. That's, that's a different, different mindset then, than download a little utility and change it. And you know, uh, in two weeks, it's a part of your job stream. Right? We're talking now about years, men, people years of development to, to make something like this work. And I think that to get there, we just need to rethink this whole process of procurement, or else we cannot get there. So that's, that's what I want to leave you with, is, is this is a big problem, it's a big opportunity. We need to think about how to leverage it. From, from my perspective, uh, in Massachusetts, when we deal with this, uh, the next steps really for us, we've started to refine the way that we do these procurements and the way they get placed online. The next step is to start to engage some of the developers that are out there. So we go out to groups like we have a local Boston PHP group or these users that are uh, developers that are actually creating software. And we have this real need in government and we have these people doing amazing development work, but they're like two ships passing in the night where they're not communicating to one another. So for us, it's getting out and letting our developers know that they should be looking at a website that we've established called Compass, where all of our state solici solicitations must go by law. So we need to get them involved with the process. And then another question that came up earlier is, um, how do we actually evaluate best value comparison once we have tools that aren't just based on cost, but we're going to be looking at other things like reliability and sustainability over uh, a long window? Um, we're still in the process. We don't really have good metrics at this point to evaluate you know, solution A versus solution B across, say, 20 different evaluation criteria. So we need to get a little bit better at, at that, and, and we need to share amongst one another how we're doing that. Um, so that's what I have from Massachusetts' perspective. Um, I think from a perspective of a multi-state collaborative software, application. I think a next step or some issues are going to be multiple states kind of working with each other for their kind of share of the project. And those procurement policies may vary from state to state. And how do you, how does a, a group of states or a group of county governments or city governments work together to create a, an open source application um, that meets all these kind of differences and nuances of the procurement rules and licensing ownerships. Um, some states and governments may not really care about owning the license of the product, but they're actually more concerned about the quality of the content or the data that it's capturing. That's what they're more concerned about. Um, I think those kind of issues are going to kind of pop up down the road. I really think it's just, it's about educating and involving the end user and the clients and working with the relationship with the procurement office to get vendors uh, involved in the process. And I think it's really going to be client agency driven and it's going to be an upward moment. So I think that's really where the pressure has to come and to change things. Well, it, I think it's easy to think about procurement as a one-size-fits-all solution, and any one-size-fits-all solution is destined to fail uh, in something as diverse as what we're talking about here. Uh, we have an evolving market and evolving technology. Um, I think John said it well that you know there are there are applications that are beginning to fill the space that look like commercial application providers. So I guess I would submit what what could be a useful next step is actually to form a community of interest around this issue that involves suppliers, involves developers, involves end users involves your procurement people and begin to craft what you think are reasonable approaches to how to make these decisions. Um, there was a time when everything was bought through an invitation to bid and that finally we moved off of that because it was, a, it was giving us failed outcomes. And so we moved to RFPs and we moved to other tools. Um, nothing holds still. 
This is about crafting the right kind of solution to reach outcomes that are cost-effective decisions for the governments that we represent. And so I don't think you can do that by simply having the procurement office siloed and giving you that solution. And you can't do it with just from the IT folks. You got to involve the supplier community, bring the stakeholders together, build a model, and then let's start working that. I think that gives you a chance for success. Well, I want to thank our panel here.